wonderful and esteemed panel uh, where we're going to be talking about lifestyle uh, segment, um, where we are, where we're going. So we're going to talk about key projects. We're going to talk about that lifestyle traveler um, and some key locations that are being focused on. So I am Melissa Banco of Banco Design out of Marietta, Georgia. I'm going to let the gentlemen introduce themselves, um, their role uh, and what they do. Um, but also, if you could ma wave a magic wand and uh, pick a destination, a location to start a project tomorrow, where would that location be? Since we know that lifestyle is so focused on location, community, and culture. So tell us who you are, what you do. Magic wand, Okay, go. Uh, Kenneth Villamil. So I'm the Global Vice President of Product and Brand Development for Hyatt. I oversee the lifestyle brand, so that's, not everyone knows what the lifestyle brands for Hyatt are, but it's, it's Andaz Alila, uh, which was an acquisition about three years ago, Thompson Hotels on, and uh, Centric, and then a new brand uh, that just recently opened in Memphis called uh, Caption okay. uh, by Hyatt. Um, if I, I essentially oversee the lifestyle, but I oversee creative for the product, so the physical product, um, and then I have a unique dual role where I actually oversee uh, the 2D as well and brand, uh, and so kind of the, the digital experience as well, um, kind of pre and post um, your stay. And then uh, if I could wave a wand, this is not me being strategic by any means. This is more about where I want to be. Okay. Um, but That's okay. Because <laughs> um, I really love... Um, travel to Patagonia, Tierra del Fuego in, in South America, and I've always wanted to go to Antarctica. Okay. Um, and it's on my bucket list. Okay. And so uh, that's absolutely not a good business model. <laughs> <laughs> it's very niche, mm -hmm. but if I were to develop uh, something, I would do something there. Okay. Hey, it's a, it's a magic wand. Do with it what you want. Go ahead. Okay. Who do we have next? Hi. Right, thanks for having me. I'm Christian glauser Benz with Dream Hotel Group, uh, Senior Vice President for our development uh, side of the business. Um, the Dream Hotel Group has four brands. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the Dream Hotel brand, Unscripted brand, by Dream Hotel Group, which is more like our soft brand, and our five-star brand, which is the Chadwell brand. So we have currently 19 properties operating in the US and uh, Southeast Asia, and we have 22 in construction and development for over $2.5 billion right now as we speak. Um, if I had to pick a place to go tomorrow, and I echo your thoughts about maybe this is not the best business idea, <laughs> but it would be Nepal. So that's in my, uh, my bucket list. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. I am Jason Chung, uh, EVP of Development for Ennismore of the Americas. Uh, Ennismore is a global collection of lifestyle brands uh, built for a purpose uh, with founder, uh, founders in mind. Uh, the company currently is a portfolio of 100 hotels. Um, including hotels within this particular market, the SLS, the Delano, uh, Mondrian, Mama Shelter, 21C, which was earlier spent on a panel earlier today, uh, Mama Shelter, and many, many others that we can talk about over this particular panel. Um, if it was a destination, this is probably more of a business strategy than a personal strategy, <laughs> uh, where I think that there's a void and an interest in the lifestyle space is really the, the ski resorts. Mm -hmm. The, the high-end luxury has permeated through with condo hotels, and then there's a legacy portion of the old ski lodges, and there's nothing that addresses the lifestyle space uh, in this marketplace. So if I had uh, my wherewithal, I would be entering those particular markets with lifestyle. Hi, everyone. I'm Jason Cruz. I'm a vice president at Starwood Capital Group, uh, bearing the title head of hotel development, which is a, a feat working for Barry with that title. But um, I'm responsible for all uh, capital, major capital projects, so $30 million or more uh, uh, under the funds at Starwood. We have about $120 billion of assets under management now um, under the, the core funds at Starwood. Uh, there's another couple billion uh, in SREIT, and then also uh, Starwood Property Trust, which is our uh, mortgage origination group. Um, to answer the question, uh, I wanted to say Patagonia, but uh, he stole it. sort of stole my thunder. I guess number two would be um, Niseko Japan. We're, we're really pushing to get uh, a, a ski-centric hotel uh, as well uh, under the one brand, and I think that just that the ethos that exists uh, inside of the Japanese culture, and specifically Niseko, is, uh, is high on the list. So. 
Okay, so there's some synergy here, so I think yeah. the gentleman should be talking after. Okay, so we all know um, that we are up against lots of hurdles in the development world these days, raising interest rates, the lack of labor, all those sorts of things. But we're going to keep it positive today. That's sort of our style. So we'd love to hear from all of you indiv individually on what are you excited about in the lifestyle segment uh, here in the next, say, three to five years, something that really has you jazzed um, aside from what we're dealing with uh, in the market a little bit. Uh, for me, I mean, from a Hyatt standpoint, I'm excited um, for Thompson. Thompson, when we acquired Thompson about three years ago, we had nine hotels. Now we have 18 and has a really big pipeline. And we just last month opened in Madrid. It's our first European uh, Thompson, so it's new to that market. We have another one coming up in Vienna. And then we have one in, in Shanghai. It will be the first in Asia. And, it, and it's a really relevant brand in those markets. And those brands, those markets are very much maturing in terms of lifestyle uh, adaptation. Um, and it's, it's also just exciting to see that lifestyle is going way beyond just hotels um, and into other spaces and blurring the lines between co-working spaces, blurring the lines between um, sharing economy, yep. um, high-end FMB, all those things. It's becoming that third place for people. Yeah. Um, which I think it always was intended to be that alternative, but now it's no longer an alternative. It's kind of becoming mainstream Absolutely. and becoming a part of the industry as a whole. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I think it's also interesting because what happened last couple of years with the pandemic, it kind of highlighted the fact that uh, brands like ours and boutique brands specifically are getting a huge boost. Um, and not only in gateway markets where we're starting construction our half a billion dollar project in Las Vegas, but also uh, middle of the country markets. So we're looking at a lot of uh, projects in, in the Carolinas, Tennessee, um, and Kentucky. And so the whole lifestyle boutique movement is moving towards second and tertiary cities. And that's also happening in, in, in markets abroad that you typically you wouldn't see that. So. If anything, um, that's a huge uh, benefit from what happened in the pandemic. It kind of let investors know that um, we didn't require the large conference business to survive, and the leisure markets really were where it was at. And so this sort of leisure now, where, where the lines are getting blurred between both the business and the leisure, it's, um, it's a great benefit to our brands. I think that's right. I mean, this lifestyle uh, sector started 20 plus years ago. And really, it's at that point, investors were saying, is this a fad? Are these hotels going to continue on? Uh, are they sustainable in, in this particular business? And I'm certainly thankful the, the bigger companies like Hilton Hyatt and Marriott have gotten into space in a big, big way. Uh, while there's competition, friendly competition, the competition that ultimately justifies this particular space. Uh, interesting statistic we were looking at uh, for this year, year over. 2019, prior to COVID, in the last trailing 90 days, uh, our hotels, same store over same store, have seen a 15 to 20% increase between RevPAR and FMB. Right, and that's a pretty staggering statistic when you're looking at a comping to your traditional hotel products in the space versus lifestyle. Right, there's certainly an engagement uh, throughout the globe uh, in all segments in terms of price point and guests that there's a demand for the lifestyle uh, product in the segment here. So. Excited about the competition, excited about continuing growing the business with everybody here. Fantastic. I think, you know, what I see that's happening in the industry that really excites me the most is just the, the focus on experience that, that we're putting into hotels. They're, they're no longer just rooms uh, that's all encompassing, right? They're, they're wellness experiences, there's programming that the, what the hotels are now offering outside of the hotels uh, via partners, and, and that that opportunity to really curate a, 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 a tailored experience for our customers that immerses them in our brands as well as the, the location that they're traveling in is, is sort of, it's very fascinating, right? We haven't seen that a lot in, in sort of broad scale hospitality. There's always been the, the pause ups and the, 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 highly, the Disney worlds of the, of, of the world, right? That have done that, but not at scale and so uh, I know SH is really focused on that, and it's, it's, it's cool. Good, good. Yeah. 
Okay, so we're all really excited to be here in Miami. Um, a little birdie has told me that there's some fabulous things happening here, uh, both with Dream, potentially, and in this more. Um, so tell us about those projects, uh, Christian and, and Jason H., um, about what projects are happening here in Miami, and why does it stay such a hot little market? Miami's a vibe, so tell us more about why we're focusing here and what some, what's going on with some uh, great new work, potentially. Well, look, we, we've been in Miami for a long time, since 2010, with our small property in Miami Beach. And then um, we, we knew that we, with a new wave of projects that we were creating, that version 2.0 of the brand in the city was, was, was due. So five years ago, we started actively looking for a location in, in Miami, in Brickle, and we looked probably at 24 different sites <laughs> for the last five years, and then eventually found a right partner in downtown Miami at the river with um, uh, Driftwood Capital. And um, we announced the project in November. So that's a $250 million uh, ground up project with 168 keys and five F&B venues and a 30,000 square feet rooftop with a nightclub and a day club and multiple swimming pools. So uh, we're very excited. I think um, the project is supposed to start construction in the next few months and we should be opening in 2024, 2025. But again, it's uh, really more like an entertainment hub. Yeah. So we'll have two buildings. One is, is strictly the hotel, and the other one is an entertainment building. And they're all kind of connected in the rooftop, in the ground floor. So it's a very complex set of uses all mixed in on a very narrow side that's about 600 feet long. So technically, we will have the longest, longest uh, waterfront frontage in the city of Miami for a hotel at 600 feet. So you can have your yachts and mega yachts parked there during uh, you know, music events, our Basel. So this will become really um, sort of a, a center hub for the entertainment for downtown Miami. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I, I can't really speak to a specific project in terms of confidentiality. We haven't announced anything in particular. But speaking of the market as a whole, Miami Beach is obviously near and dear to our heart. Uh, 20 years ago, one of our predecessor founders, Ian Trigger, uh, recreated the Delano in South Beach and really moved the center of gravity from Ocean Drive up to 15th, 16th, 17th Street. And you've seen that continue to evolve. The market has continued to evolve all the way up to Eden Rock here, where we're sitting here today, and filling in continuously. Um, last year, we saw rev par numbers, historical rev par numbers that we've never seen before. Uh, and continue to peak. We're looking at next year's forecast, and we believe the market's going to continue to grow, right? Uh, as for our portfolio of the 100 hotels that we operate, we have eight of them in Miami. Uh, so it's almost a, a central hub, a global hub uh, for America, is a global hub for, for our brands. Uh, we have the Fiena, the Mondrian, the Delano, uh, three SLSs, three Hides. And where why we're quite excited about this particular marketplace is we've got another... 11 brands that we could potentially grow in this marketplace up and down the chain scale. Uh, so we're looking at uh, potentially bringing Mama Shelter out of Paris, the Hoxton brand, and others uh, into this particular market to round out this, this market in terms of uh, experiences from our brand point of view. Listen, we all work in a lot of different markets, and not every market can pull off day clubbing. And I think Miami is doing that well. <laughs> so we'll continue to stay plugged into what you gentlemen are working on. Um, so as we're talking about location uh, and, and, uh, and markets, um, we'd love to hear, honestly, from all of you, but maybe Jason C. and Kenneth can start off with what other markets are hot right now. What are up and coming? I'll start. Um, <laughs> so in terms of what's hot right now, I think um, it's been alluded to, Christian alluded to as well, is, our gateway markets are huge, right? And, and leisure is huge, but it's the second and tertiary markets actually mm -hmm. really big too. Um, and there's a lot of growth there um, in our select upscale, upper upscale. Um, and just talking about Caption right now, a Caption is designed to be a select lifestyle mm -hmm. brand. And we're looking at places like Madison, like Tallahassee, like Jacksonville. Um, places like St. Louis, uh, Memphis. Um, we just opened in Memphis, but also, you know, we're, we have uh, two signed deals, one in Chattanooga, one also in Nashville. Nashville obviously is a big market, but there's all smaller markets um, and subsidiary markets like, like Sacramento mm -hmm. um, uh, is one of them, or San Jose. Lots of growth in those markets, especially in the leisure, but also it, what's great about 
uh, lifestyle is that it doesn't rely too heavily on the mice business, that there's another component to it that drives revenue. Um, and then fortunately we kind of insulated ourselves a bit. We have lots of um, investment in this market, but also Latin America and the Caribbean and vacation and all inclusive. We just um, acquired um, Apple Leisure Group. So we just acquired over 100 all-inclusive hotels, which wasn't really our core business. Uh, but over COVID, it's been more and more important uh, to invest in, in the leisure and the lifestyle uh, and some of the luxury. Okay. okay. Uh, ditto. Um, <laughs> no, but <laughs> um, Latin America, especially. Um, Sunnyvale, California. It's, it's, I think for the fund, it's less gateway markets. For, S, for SH, it, it is gateway markets, um, especially with Baccarat and, and One Hotels. Uh, Treehouse Hotels is, you know, we're going in Manchester, England, um, sort of secondary cities. Treehouse is our Sunnyvale property as well. Um, and, and tons of leisure markets. Um, there's, Barry is very, very interested in, in taking the fund to, to sort of those irreplaceable assets. You see us obviously striving to get one Hanalei Bay done. Um, we're looking in, at several properties in Napa, uh, Montana, um, coastal Mexico, but like not Cabo, mm -hmm. La Paz, um, <coughs> Todos Santos, like the, just where we can create, like I said before, you know, kind of unique experiences curated to our customers and, and where there's probably still opportunity left in the market to really realize a gain. Um, especially now, given where interest rates and, yeah. and everything else is going. Mm -hmm. You gentlemen have anything else to add to that, just about sure. maybe uh, even surprising an, markets that are you know, on that? I'd say surprising markets, but just kind of general strategy. Obviously, our brand and any of the brands obviously want to be in your top gateway cities, top tier cities. I think as a strategy, really also to follow where the investment's going, right? where the dollars are going, going back to start with capital investment strategy versus the brand strategy, and we're seeing where there's opportunities, like was described in a prior panel, 21C in St. Louis, right? Markets where historically lifestyle hotels would not have gone. Uh, now with the permission of larger companies that have more scale, have better distribution systems, uh, there's an ability and an opportunity for the investor or developer to get into a secondary market, which is much higher of a turn. Mm -hmm. But then with that said, historically those markets did not have a lifestyle oriented hotel. Uh, and what we've seen, particularly with our 21C product and brand, is coming into markets with more of a straightforward traditional brand offering in that marketplace. And once you bring something that's a little different, a little differentiated, it becomes you know, a center hub uh, and, and a different, uh, different offering for the, the community itself. So that's the direction that we're going, in addition to the, obviously the markets that everybody would want to be in. Yeah. Anything to add to that? Of course, I mean, I think uh, you hit in on Nell and, and Louisville, Kentucky, where you guys have a, one of the first mm -hmm. 21 Cs, I think. We are building across the street from you guys. So we're going through these markets, <coughs> yes, because the money's going there, but also I think the demographic, the younger um, demographic and psychographic of these cities, it says, well, I cannot afford to live in New York or LA, I'm gonna stay here and make a living here. Mm -hmm. We need all these amenities. We need these hotels. We need these restaurants and nightclubs and rooftop bars in our hotels. So there's, um, it's a different trend than it was basically, you know, in the early 2000s prior to 2008. And I think what we learned during the re Great Recession of 2008 is that everybody was looking in New York, LA, San Francisco, and people would joke like, "You're going to build a hotel in Nashville?" This is in 2007. And look now, I mean, it's yeah. every brand is there. So. Uh, it's definitely evolved, and I think it's great because the U.S. is such a big country. You have so many of these markets. That's available. right. I think you know, work, the working from home and the aspect of being able to work remotely has certainly changed the migration, the populational change, in addition to the affordability uh, in the coastal cities to secondary markets, right? And as you said, right, the, the offerings are currently not there, though the folks that have moved into those markets are expecting what they had had in the markets right. that they were prior to right. living in. So. Look at the success that AJ Capital's had with Graduate, right? Mm -hmm. and, and some of these, Great. not even secondary markets, but you know, total third tier markets. Mm -hmm. um, that, that's, there's a strong yeah. message there that there's demand for, for what we're all collectively doing outside of the gateway markets. Right. 
So we've talked a lot about location and what that strategically looks like, but that also is a great segue into the lifestyle traveler in general. So um, what do you gentlemen think about um, how the definition of that traveler has evolved? Um, are we marketing to a different demographic than maybe we were four or five years ago? Um, so let's start with Jason H. Um, and hear from Kenneth too, but would honestly love to hear from all of you. What does that traveler look like? So, you know, markets have changed, locations have changed, but we also, we all know that we are designing and developing to that end user, right? So what does that, what does that traveler look like and how has that evolved? I mean, going back to how it's evolved and how it all started, right? <laughs> really, when you thought about the entryway into lifestyle, a decade or two ago, it was New York, Miami, and LA, and there was no, nowhere else, no exception. Lifestyle hotels were not going into any particular market within the United States, right? And that it was addressing the typical jet-setting lifestyle, uh, you know, the, the cool folks that are ultimately coming into that hotel. And it was a very small segment uh, that they were addressing, right? Today, fast forward today, I think the lifestyle is addressing, even within our platform, with, with the number of brands we have, we're addressing everybody. It's just an alternative product, and you're also seeing, again, traditional hotels getting into the more design-oriented space, taking a, a, book, a page from the lifestyle book and creating F&B, different activations. And so what is lifestyle, right? How is that defined? I mean, I think it's defined, uh, it's, it's, it's hard to define, right? It could be your lifestyle in terms of your, your intent to go golfing, right? That could be lifestyle. It could be going to a, a day club, beach club, uh, it could be any of your interest, right? And I think now that there's a permeation, and no one would argue that there's too many brands out there, but the brands out there to address everybody's interest, right? And I think what we're trying to drive in is when you're traveling, when you're spending hard-earned dollars and going there, you want a experience that is expeditional to your typical day-to-day, -day, right? While enjoying and taking it within your interest and, and bringing that and augmenting that. So it, it is now, to me, you know, a demographic, a social graphic, it's everybody, right, uh, it's that, that you're ultimately looking for. Uh, okay. It's mainstream to a degree. Yeah, I, I second that. It's in, in the past when I worked with Starwood, I worked on W, St. Regis, Limeridian, um, and it, we were essentially, you know, being influenced by, you know, the Morgans Group and by independent hotels, and it was a little more formulaic, mm -hmm. uh, and the expectations weren't as high as I feel they are now. Uh, and, and now there are expectations because people have gone to different markets, feeder markets, gateway markets, second, tertiary, and it's kind of um, pervaded into the kind of ethos and the culture of travel. Uh, this expectation, um, as, as Jason mentioned, of experiences versus things, mm -hmm. um, and what defines luxury is not no longer just the materiality of the space and the physical product, but also what happens in that space, Absolutely. how you're programming, how you're activating. Um, and it's become pervasive enough where it's hard to discern what's a lifestyle hotel and what's not a lifestyle <laughs> hotel. And you know, now we've, we've done research because you know, all of our companies are trying to figure out what do you, do you call it lifestyle? Do, do guests know what lifestyle is? And when we did the research, um, they don't use the term lifestyle to even Google. Uh, they use the term boutique or stylish, mm -hmm. uh, modern, things of that nature. And they're really just looking for something that has a unique experience that's a little more meaningful, whether that's golf or skiing, or, or that's uh, day clubs and nightlife, um, or that's arts and culture. Um, and you see it kind of uh, pervasive even in the big box hotels now. If you want to activate spaces, there's that halo effect of, of having a unique experience or activation or programming or live music or performance uh, or what, what have you, like this hotel. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I, I know I oversee lifestyle, uh, but it's, the lives are very blurred mm -hmm. now. And, and the expectations are higher, not higher in the sense of, of, of the, the cost. It's, it's more, you know, that it's connected to the community. A lot of people want social responsibility. A lot of people want sustainability. And, and that's definitely a trend. Um, but at the same time, um, like everyone else has said, it's not a demographic anymore. It's a psychographic, it's a mindset. Uh, and that mindset goes across all ages and, and demographies. Is it a good thing that those lines are blurred? I think it's a good thing in the sense that then you have to try a lot harder to be differentiated. Mm -hmm. um, and you don't just have empty box hotels with empty lobbies. Um, we don't even like the idea of calling a lobby a lobby. It should be more like a lounge. lounge. It should be more like mm -hmm. F&B mixed in, just like there's a bar in the middle of this space. Mm -hmm. If there wasn't a bar and it was just seating, was well, just a transactional or transient space, why would you want to waste that space? Right. Um, and so it pushes, at least me and my team, 
to think outside the box, and as well as, you know, we were early on the scene with, say, Andaz, and we tried to kind of get rid of the front desk and have complimentary uh, mini bar and com complimentary items and, and have a, a bar that was central versus back of house, front of house, have more peer-to-peer -peer interactions, chicken on a tablet. We were a little too ahead mm. at the time, but now we don't have that pushback anymore. Now the expectation is, well, how are we going to differentiate ourselves? How is it more unique? How are you programming this? And when you want to program a space, you have to think about how you're designing that space as well. It's not just you have a live performance in there. It's what's happening in the space in the future. Is it evergreen? Can you continue to grow and evolve. change and mm -hmm. evolve with this, this, um, this mindset? Um, and also the introduction of digital and, and sharing these experiences with people. Um, and, you know, this, the hotel is, is your backdrop to a vacation or a business trip or a leisure trip, all the above. So I think the expectations are higher, but I think that's a good thing. Yeah. And I think it's good that it's influencing the rest of, of, um, of the hotel market. Okay. Anything it's, else to add? Oh, to it's that? certainly a challenge, right? And the blurred lines between lifestyle or traditional hotels. Right. Uh, it's a challenge for us, right? Our portfolio and the number of brands that we have uh, with the merger and acquisition of the number of brands, they were built from founders with a specific point of view. And uh, we are very conscious of keeping those brands within their swim lanes, right? Not to merge a coffee concept into one or the 21C art program into another. Uh, they are very distinct in nature. Uh, could, it could easily merge into one and there's no distinction where the brand is and where we're ultimately trying to push uh, the brand to the consumer, right? So it's a challenge, but... Uh, we're, we're, we're trying our best to keep them there. But you're building Up that expectation. Yeah. Yes. Well, there's, there's this innate desire for the revenue managers to differentiate yeah. business travel from leisure travel and group, right? And what we're seeing is it's all blending together now, mm -hmm. right? People are coming. They're not staying for two days on business mm -hmm. and then moving to another hotel for two days of leisure. They're, we're getting four night stays instead of two night stays. Um, and then where that, before uh, going to revenue management, we, before we had hotels that 80% of the revenue was out of rooms. Now our projects yeah. are 60% food and beverage revenue, 70% yeah. mm -hmm. depending on the location and the size of the F&B program. So finance wise, um, can you mention that before? It's like there's nothing worse than an empty lobby. That's mm -hmm. the it's not money happening. that costs to build this lobby is not generating any ROI. So, Activating those spaces and, and, and blurring the FNB within the public spaces is super important for the financial stability and, and feasibility of a project. So a lot of the, and I think this is appropriate for this conference because a lot of you guys are in the construction industry, is that a lot of the money that's being put in this hotel is going towards the public spaces in the FNB. Uh, our project in Miami right now is it's completely uh, flipped in the sense that rooms have a budget, but the FNB program A is huge and it's basically it's, its own little PNL and not little but the amount of money and budget there is justifiable because of the revenue that we're going to get out of that so um, lenders obviously don't like that very much because <laughs> they don't want to finance restaurants but at the end of the day it's all part of the same thing and these lines are getting blurred on the financial side as well. I, I think Lenders are happy to finance restaurants, by the way. I mean, there, there's a number of cases with SLS uh, South Beach, right, which I was part of the development of back in the day. But that, that was a restaurant that just happened to have rooms above it. Um, mm. there, there are clear case studies where in select markets, F&B is a very powerful way to, to close the gap. Um, on the investment, right, and make it m more enticing. Well, to uh, that, right, the, yeah. the F&B actually is a complement to the rooms, right? Yeah. At the end of the day, the rooms may be, right, going back to where you're spending the money, how you're developing the rooms, where the rooms are important, right? From, from our point of view, a lot of the brands that we have are, are so F&B focused that the experience is driven in that public area, That's which is actually ultimately coming driving to stay with you. Right, right, we're coming to stay, right, <laughs> for the accessibility for that particular venue, and it's a one-stop shop within the box, right? And so... The, the rate or the rev part in those boxes are punching above its rate versus your traditional hotel because of the offerings there. And you see Vegas even pivoting to, to, to your project there, right? To a lifestyle model now. Pe people are now choosing where they stay in Las Vegas based on the F&B and the entertainment offerings mm -hmm. offered there, not the theme of the casino or the location on the strip. Um, and, and so it, it gets, I mean, we drill down pretty intensively in the underwriting process at Starwood to, to make sure, you know, back to a comment that was made earlier, 
that every single square foot that we're building has a return on it, that, that, and, and that it's not sitting idle at, at any moment. I mean, in, in Hanalei Bay, we took out an 8,000 square foot ballroom because it got booked four times a year, <laughs> historically. And so what, what sort of return are you getting on 8,000 square feet that cost $1,500 a square foot to, to remodel, right? Mm -hmm. And so we've pivoted all that space into a, sort of a comprehensive wellness offering to, to really sort of support the location that we're in. And we're using a lot more multifunction space too. Yeah. So an event space, anything can be an event space. Right. Right. And um, as long as you can corner off and you could actually still have access for other guests, mm -hmm. um, that's not just, you know, absolutely. That's why we always need outdoor grounds. That's why we need these interstitial spaces. Um, it's not just about formal ballrooms anymore, junior mm -hmm. ballrooms anymore, or just meeting rooms. There's lots of pantries and F&B mixed and, and mm -hmm. wet bars that can be activated or areas for performance, um, just like for this conference. And, and, oh. and hotels have had to, I don't want to say pivot, but just evolve. Yeah. Um, the, event, the whole event space is completely changed. That's changed. As well as I and I think also the pandemic was a trigger to that where now your corporates don't want to have these sort of large formal meetings. They want to have these off-site retreats. They want smaller venues, more intimate venues. Um, to what you're saying, Ken, is like... Different features, different amenities. All our projects moving forward, they have a very different take on the event space mm -hmm. format compared to 10, 15, 20 years ago. And it's all about FNB incorporation, outdoor spaces, communal spaces mm -hmm. that they can come out and share and then go back into their meetings. So it's a little bit like the story of the co-working mixing with boutique and hospitality. It's the co-working is also creeping up into the hotel. And one way to do it is through the event spaces that you kind of create your own co-working spaces through your own event spaces. So there's all this stuff that's happening and it's very organic. I don't think anybody knows where it's headed, but I think if you listen to your client and your guest and you follow them, they'll take you there. I think they are the ones who actually know best what to do with their own time. <laughs> so is that the key takeaway, is that it really is a traveler that's sort of telling us what their expectation is and we're, we're pivoting around that? Would you agree with that or disagree with that? It's evolving, yeah. 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 Okay. Um, so uh, clearly there's a ton of opportunity going forward in this segment. Um, we all are faced with significant challenges. Again, there's lots of chatter around that, right? Rising uh, interest rates and construction costs, lack of labor. How are you approaching these challenges um, moving forward with creative solutions to offset these hurdles that are being thrown at all of us? <laughs> so uh, what does that look like and how you're pivoting around those challenges? From the design side, um, I'd say, and we were talking about this earlier, yeah. is that we're trying to source more locally, manufacture more locally, at least um, a majority of the components of FF&E. Mm -hmm. um, and, and also as a company, and we, we've really focused on leisure um, and hotels that can manage both leisure and business. Mm -hmm. um, and just, as I mentioned earlier, just focused on the Caribbean, Mexico, leisure destinations, because um, during COVID, you know, you have a strong domestic traveler uh, going to these places. And, and so with all the, the costs, interest rates, costs, all those things, yeah. understanding that. Um, but yeah, with, with design, there's, I will, I will say there's a lot of value engineering. Um, really? Tell me have, more. I'm not... The costs that, have gone up ex, uh, exponentially. <laughs> um, and there's just a different expectation now uh, when, when it's underwritten. And um, we, we try to have contingencies, but now we've inflated those even more so. Um, it has slowed down some of our, our build-outs and, and construction, uh, but it hasn't stopped our projects. Uh, it's just kind of changed how we approach them. Um, and there has been more investment and more JVs as well, mm -hmm. uh, just so that we're working with a development group or an owner. Um, the caption in Memphis was a 50-50 was a JV as well, uh, with a centric uh, hotel, so two hotels. So, um, uh, And so, yeah, I, I think it's it's... It's just we've adapted, um, essentially. Uh, but from the design side, it, it is about sourcing locally. It is about getting those lead times and sometimes being more clever about the, the design and the outfitting of the, the, the rooms, yeah. the public space. Being a little creative, maybe outside the box, um, what we were doing a couple of years ago, right? Absolutely, yeah. Anybody else have anything to add? Yeah, we're definitely seeing a slowdown on the financing, mm -hmm. obviously, because the rates are not sustainable for a lot of these two, $300 million projects. Having said that, I think that um, you know, rates will come down eventually in the next year or so, who knows. 
but um, it also helps you pivot and get creative about the solutions. And a lot of that we're looking at now, it's actually existing builds for repositioning. So mm -hmm. you're gonna do uh, renovations, rebranding, uh, because they are easier to get financed mm -hmm. and, and there's less of that sort of risk for the lender. Uh, but having said that, we haven't lost any project. We've slowed a couple of them. Yeah. They were shovel ready. And now they are basically at sort of capital market discussion phase. Mm -hmm where the lenders, and I need to meet Jason's lenders because my lenders are not very helpful, <laughs> but the lenders are like coming up with all sorts of excuses. And so it's interesting to see how, how long this will last and what impact it will have. I don't think at the end of the day it will have a, a long lasting impact in our industry. I think it's more of a, a breather and, um, and then hopefully it gets uh, addressed soon. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a retooling is how I would retooling. describe it, right? Um, Steel, concrete are, are going to remain elevated just because, I mean, we haven't even really begun to see the impact of the, what, the $1.5 trillion infrastructure package working through the construction market. I think that that's part of what you're seeing with architectural billings, right, is all, all in engineering billings is that's, that all that work is just coming out of the design phase and is now gonna go into construction. And so there's going to be continued labor impacts um, on those, sort of core infrastructure trades, right? And so the focus uh, within the fund definitely is repositionings um, of existing assets so that you're kind of avoiding the, all of that front end work uh, that needs to be done, so. Exactly what everybody's saying to is existing hotels that are cash flowing today. When you look at that vintage over the last couple of years, uh, owners really used all their FF&E reserve, right? Just to keep the balance sheet alive and and pay bills, right? Not yeah. to refresh the rooms. And so at this point in time, there's a, there's a huge supply of hotels that are currently already do a refresher or a pip, right? So the natural uh, pathway into a conversion to a lifestyle hotel in this space. In addition to obviously with interest rates rising, existing hotel with in place cash flows that you could potentially stay open while renovating is it, certainly a, a path of least resistance as it relates to financing uh, a new project uh, moving forward in the short term. This, this was touched on this morning, but I, you know, I see it firsthand. There, there's literally trillions of dollars of pent up money waiting to be deployed. Um, and so we've just got to figure out the, the road ahead and, and where things are going to settle. It's sort of a, everyone's in a wait and see mm -hmm. mode right now. Once, once we see with some clarity or partial clarity, there's, gonna, there's going to be a frenzy of, of investment. When do you think that waiting period is going to be over? How long are we going to wait and see? Well, I'm not the Fed chairman. But I'm, <laughs> no, it's, Give us some insight. If, 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 if I had to be. guess, maybe 15 to 18 months. Yeah. Like it, it, as, it, soon as, as soon as inflation starts yeah. tapering down and, and there's really a, a retooling or slowing down that's forced by the Fed, then you'll see those rates uh, coming down and then will, the window will open and it'll be a very uh, sort of a V shape recovery both on, gates will open on stocks and everything else. So uh, we, we made it through COVID. I think we can make it through this yes, <laughs> quite easily. Yes. You also see, uh, putting, putting aside interest rates for a second, when you look at the recovery <clears throat> of hospitality over the last couple of downturns and cycles, right? And when you have a hotel product that's essentially a overnight rent roll, you see real time improvement. And when you see that improvement historically, hotels have seen improvement track faster than the overall recovery in the stock market, right? So when you see that happening, naturally there's gonna be more liquidity in the marketplace. Sure. Folks will then come back into the space once they see a, a, a clear path to, to recovery in our, in our product, in our industry. Yeah. So on the topic of economic trends, uh, we know that leisure travel consistently looks at this lifestyle segment for their accommodations. How has the strength of the dollar impacted your forecasts? Um, are you concerned about losing that international traveler that we relied on um, as it becomes more expensive to travel here to the U.S.? So Jason C. and Kenneth, but open to all, of course. So what does that look like with our international travelers? Uh, there's, uh, in, in the Hawaii market, there's a huge concern, right, that, that you won't see the Asian consumer um, that you, you typically would, which impacts us. There's, there's concern, uh, you know, here in Miami, the gateway markets that you're, you're not going to get the, the international tourism that you would traditionally expect. Yeah. I'll, I'll say that 
domestic demand remains really robust. And so that may just replace that international consumer. Um, it's, it's a little too early to tell, uh, in, in my opinion, um, but, but it's, a, it's a very valid concern. Uh, if, the, if the dollar stays too strong for too long, then, then we, we definitely have a, a pretty critical issue. Yeah, I was going to say the same. And there's a lot of strong domestic demand. Um, also, we have uh, a lot of leisure destinations in Europe, and so there's an outflow mm -hmm. of Americans um, to Asia, to Europe, and, and those countries have opened, um, aside from China. Um, and that's, that's why during COVID, we've invested in leisure and invested in the Caribbean, invested in Latin America, understanding the strong domestic growth. Obviously, we couldn't have foretold that interest rates would go this high. Um, but kind of as you said before, we're kind of retooling um, and adapting. But um, we've built in a, a good cushion, if you will. OK. Anybody else have anything to add to that with international travel? No, I think, uh, I think Jason mentioned it well. Is also, I mean, Hawaii's got primarily Japanese tourists. The yen is at its lowest in, what, 40 years versus the dollar. So they're going to think twice before spending money there. I was this summer in Switzerland, where I'm from, and I was spending less money in Zurich than in Miami. <laughs> so many ways, and a one-to-one -one euro uh, Swiss yeah. franc to the dollar to the actually first time in a long time. So the parity of these currencies is really opening a lot of opportunities. And yeah. also, uh, if we're expecting to feed our hotels with foreign traveler to up your game, and say, okay, you're gonna pay $500 per night, but you're gonna have to get something much more than just a night in a hotel. So I think it's gonna push hospitality also to be a bit more uh, aggressive with the offering mm -hmm. and the quality of experience versus someone coming from London say, you know, why are we gonna go to Miami and spend all this money in New York? I say, well, they've got this going on or that going on. So something has to, um, and I think we're, we're gonna be in a good situation though at the end of the day, especially when the boutique and the lifestyle for markets like Miami, New York, uh, you will have that uh, loyal customer coming even if the rates are higher. Well, that's a really great segue to sort of the next question I'd like to ask you gentlemen. So um, we're looking down the line. Um, what are ways that you think that the lifestyle segment will have to adapt? So the experiences that we are delivering um, at our properties, um, what is gonna stay familiar to our travel and what, is, what needs to evolve? Or what are you already seeing that are major changes uh, in involvement that you're providing to, to provide that experience, right? So if the rates are gonna go up, what are we doing to create those different experiences to the traveler that we have? For, now and five years down the road. From my perspective, it's kind of twofold. It's on one side, uh, we're, we're, we're trying to learn operationally how to streamline, yeah. how to leverage digital. And surprisingly, I, I hadn't worked in select service, but creating the new brand caption in select, I learned a lot about the kind of streamlining operations, streamlining design to, to elevate the operations. Mm -hmm. um, with that said, caption, the focus was on the F&B, but typically F&B is not the focus for a select service brand. Um, and so we knew we had to um, streamline operations elsewhere in the hotel mm -hmm. to be able to afford the FTEs for a full-time barista with multiple shifts of full-time uh, bartender, full-time kitchen manager, chef, what have you. Um, and so we're, we've been leveraging, just as everyone's seen, QR codes and, and streamlining check-ins with QR codes and taking some of the strain out of the, 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 out of the staff so that we could focus on those elements within lifestyle. On the, on the higher end, um, it's, to, to everyone else's point, it's, it's about differentiating yourself, having a meaningful experience that connects with someone emotionally, um, and it's hard to streamline that. Um, you wanna have extremely elevated F&B, uh, and you wanna find an opportunity to design something and an experience that is not competing directly with someone else. It's, it's offering something different, and the programming's offering something different, activation's offering something different. Um, and to your point, you, know, you need to elevate what the experience is, because you're going to have your loyal customers, but how are you going to uh, capture um, the rest of the market no. um, if they've never stayed at your hotel? And, and what's your offering? And if you start kind of cutting your nose to spite your face um, for cost cutting, mm -hmm. um, well, then you're going to be sacrificing that ADR overall sure. in the long run uh, and then the ROI. And so I think, you know, it's some of our higher end hotels, we need to, we're, we're having to invest more than we would in the past just because of costs and cost of labor. 
but from the select service side, I think there are a lot of opportunities in the mid-scale, upscale uh, segments to streamline operations and, and leverage the systems, the back, back-end systems and, and digital. Okay. Yeah, and I think also we came from a pandemic. I could bring in the pandemic all over and over and over. But basically, we learned how to do things with much less for the last two years. And, mm-hmm. and I think that sort of frugal mindset has allowed um, hotels to become very profitable with less resources. And a little bit what you're saying, can allocate now more of that towards the experiences versus just um, sort of routine, operational, back of house sort of things where the guest doesn't see it really, and thanks to technology and other things. Um, but at the end of the day, the experience of these properties that we're building in different cities or markets, be it Nashville or Louisville or Miami, um, the success really uh, sits in the fact that the property is connected to the lifestyle of the city, the community. And if there's a music festival or the, the Kentucky Derby or something, that all these events are integrated within your experience. So if you're going there from abroad or from a different city, you're, you know you're going to get the full-on commu- like city experience through that <coughs> property. And I think that's where um, the winners are going to be. At the end of the day, it's, it's you know, connecting with the, the, uh, the vein of the city where you are uh, in whichever market, even abroad in Mexico or the Caribbean. Like for, for us, we, you know, we operate under a kind of 360-degree ecosystem as, a, as an organization, right? What we've, we're obviously first and foremost a hotel company, a hotel company that also has a significant F&B uh, division, including an interior design division that uh, we, we, we have in-house. Uh, on top of that, digital marketing partnerships, uh, so all of the above, right? And hopefully that, that system trickles down to the experience of the guests when they come into our hotel, where we don't lease out most of our restaurants and bars. It's a seamless uh, business where the guest is coming in and our general manager is responsible for the experience from check-in through the meals through check-out, right? And so uh, that in itself, inclusive to, I think we talked a little bit about that, kind of the the, the difference of how, where the traveler's expectations are, the work, live, play, right? We've created a concept called working from, which is a mini working or a co-working space, right? We've already, you know, a lot of our brands already have lobbies that are there for socializing, there for meetings, and, and we've taken it one step further and included within our Hoxton brand uh, a couple of floors of co-working space like a WeWorks, right? And there's a membership or a hot desk if you're in that town for a couple of days and you actually need a place or a quiet place to make a call or do business outside of the social environment of the lobby hub, okay. uh, mm-hmm. something that is ultimately created. So we're continuing to refine that experience uh, through and through. Okay. I see we're almost running out of time, but like it's genuine service delivery, but like yeah. and using the technology and the tools that, that to Christian's point that we've we've arrived upon because of the pandemic to to really engage the guest mm-hmm. in a meaningful way without being creepy about it, right? There's, <laughs> there's all this data and Salesforce and LinkedIn where you can, you can really get in there and just kind of surprise someone when they show up. But when, when, I mean, I'm sure you've all been a guest repeatedly at a hotel and, and arrived at the front desk and, and they ask, oh, is this your first time staying with us? And you just want to blow your brains out, you know? It's like, I've, I've stayed been here, here 10 times this year. Yeah, it's like <laughs> I've stayed here 65 <laughs> nights this year and you're asking yeah. me if this is the first time I've stayed here. It, you should know that when the, yeah. the, the operator should know that when you arrive at the desk and it's, it's taking Salesforce and, and all of the data that we're gathering, right? And, and plugging that in to the, the script for lack of a better term that is the check-in so that the agent is, is acknowledging, oh, we see you were here last week. Thank you for coming back. Uh, we know that you like the oceanfront room and, mm-hmm. and um, you know, chocolates on your pillow at night, right? Like, and just, cause that, get, that connects them to your hotel that makes them a repeat customer, even if they're paying $100 more than they are down the street, just that little bit of attention is, is enough to, to, to gain their business forever. Right, and that's human to human, right? So yeah. you can leverage technology and the tools to do that to increase efficiencies In and all of that, but it's yeah. still human to human. You it's still want that person that goes, this is your 10th time here this year, hello, Ms. Banco, how are you? Yeah, you the, the, the yeah. tech so. should be in the background. It shouldn't yes. be at the forefront, uh, you know, and, unless you're, across the street from Google, maybe, or, or something in, in, in San Jose. Yeah. Um, but that's just my opinion, right? But I, I think 
we have all these tools. It's, it's how we deploy them and, and, and make them work for us. Absolutely. Well, there obviously is so much going on in, in, this, uh, in this segment. Um, we will continue to track all the wonderful things that you gentlemen are doing. We very much appreciate your insight today in uh, talking about the lifestyle. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.